Section 36 of The Pink Fairy Book. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elliot Miller. The Pink Fairy Book by Andrew Lang. King Lindorm from the Swedish. There once lived a king and a queen who ruled over a very great kingdom. They had large revenues and lived happily with each other. But as the years went past, the king's heart became heavy, because the queen had no children. She also sorrowed greatly over it, because although the king said nothing to her about this trouble, yet she could see that it vexed him that they had no heir to the kingdom, and she wished every day that she might have one. One day a poor old woman came to the castle and asked to speak with the queen. The royal servants answered that they could not let such a poor beggar woman go into their royal mistress. They offered her a penny, and told her to go away. Then the woman desired them to tell the queen that there stood at the palace gate one who could help her secret sorrow. This message was taken to the queen, who gave them orders to bring the old woman to her. This was done, and the old woman said to her, I know your secret sorrow, O queen, and am come to help you in it. You wish to have a son. You shall have two if you follow my instructions. The queen was greatly surprised that the old woman knew her secret wish so well, and promised to follow her advice. "'You must have a bath set in your room, O queen,' said she, "'and filled with running water. When you have bathed in this you will find, under the bath, two red onions. These you must carefully peel and eat, and in time your wish will be fulfilled.' The queen did as the poor woman told her and after she had bathed she found the two onions under the bath. They were both alike in size and appearance. When she saw these she knew that the woman had been something more than she seemed to be, and in her delight she ate up one of the onions, skin and all. When she had done so she remembered that the woman had told her to peel them carefully before she ate them. It was now too late for the one of them, but she peeled the other and then ate it too. In due time it happened as the woman had said, but the first that the queen gave birth to was a hideous lindorm, or serpent. No one saw this but her waiting-woman, who threw it out of the window into the forest beside the castle. The next that came into the world was the most beautiful little prince, and he was shown to the king and queen, who knew nothing about his brother the lindorm. There was now joy in all the palace, and over the whole country on account of the beautiful prince but no one knew that the queen's firstborn was a lindorm, and lay in the wild forest. Time passed with the king, the queen, and the young prince in all happiness and prosperity, until he was twenty years of his age. Then his parents said to him that he should journey to another kingdom and seek for himself a bride, for they were beginning to grow old, and would fain see their son married, before they were laid in their grave. The prince obeyed had his horses harnessed to his gilded chariot, and set out to woo his bride. But when he came to the first crossways there lay a huge and terrible lindorm right across the road, so that his horses had to come to a standstill. "'Where are you driving to?' asked the lindorm with a hideous voice. "'That does not concern you,' said the prince. "'I am the prince, and can drive where I please.' "'Turn back,' said the lindorm. I know your errand, but you shall get no bride until I have got a mate and slept by her side. The prince turned home again, and told the king and queen what he had met at the crossroads, but they thought he should try again on the following day, and see whether he could not get past it, so that he might seek a bride in another kingdom. The prince did so, but got no further than the first crossroads. There lay the lindorm again, who stopped him in the same way as before. The same thing happened on the third day when the prince tried to get past. The lindorm said with a threatening voice that before the prince could get a bride, he himself must find a mate. When the king and queen heard this for the third time, they could think of no better plan than to invite the lindorm to the palace, and they should find him a mate. They thought that a lindorm would be quite well satisfied with anyone they might give him and so they would get some slave-woman to marry the monster. The lindorm came to the palace and received a bride of this kind, but in the morning she lay torn in pieces. So it happened every time that the king and queen compelled any woman to be his bride. 
The report of this soon spread over all the country. Now it happened that there was a man who had married a second time, and his wife heard of the Lindorm with great delight. Her husband had a daughter by his first wife who was more beautiful than all other maidens, and so gentle and good that she won the heart of all who knew her. His second wife, however, had also a grown-up daughter, who by herself would have been ugly and disagreeable enough, but beside her good and beautiful stepsister seemed still more ugly and wicked, so that all turned from her with loathing. The stepmother had long been annoyed that her husband's daughter was so much more beautiful than her own, and in her heart she conceived a bitter hatred for her stepdaughter. When she now heard that there was in the king's palace a lindorm which tore in pieces all the women that were married to him, and demanded a beautiful maiden for his bride, she went to the king, and said that her stepdaughter wished to wed the lindorm, so that the country's only prince might travel and seek a bride. At this the king was greatly delighted, and gave orders that the young girl should be brought to the palace. When the messengers came to fetch her she was terribly frightened, for she knew that it was her wicked stepmother who in this way was aiming at her life. She begged that she might be allowed to spend another night in her father's house. This was granted her, and she went to her mother's grave. There she lamented her hard fate in being given over to the Lindorm, and earnestly prayed her mother for counsel. How long she lay there by the grave and wept one cannot tell, but sure it is that she fell asleep and slept until the sun rose. Then she rose up from the grave, quite happy at heart, and began to search about in the fields. There she found three nuts, which she carefully put away in her pockets. "'When I come into very great danger, I must break one of these,' she said to herself. Then she went home, and set out quite willingly with the king's messengers. When these arrived at the palace with the beautiful young maiden, everyone pitied her fate. But she herself was of good courage, and asked the queen for another bridal chamber than the one the Lindorm had had before. She got this, and then she requested them to put a pot full of strong lye on the fire, and lay down three new scrubbing brushes. The queen gave orders that everything should be done as she desired, and then the maiden dressed herself in seven clean snow-white shirts, and held her wedding with the Lindorm. When they were left alone in the bridal chamber, the Lindorm, in a threatening voice, ordered her to undress herself. "'Undress yourself first, said she. "'None of the others bade me do that,' he said in surprise. "'But I bid you,' said she. Then the Lindorm began to writhe and groan and breathe heavily, and after a little he had cast his outer skin, which lay on the floor, hideous to behold. Then his bride took off one of her snow-white shirts and cast it on the Lindorm's skin. Again he ordered her to undress, and again she commanded him to do so first. He had to obey, and with groaning and pain cast off one skin after another, and for each skin the maiden threw off one of her shirts, until there lay on the floor seven Lindorm skins and six snow-white shirts. The seventh she still had on. The Lindorm now lay before her as a formless, slimy mass, which she, with all her might, began to scrub with the lye and new scrubbing brushes. When she had nearly worn out the last of these, there stood before her the loveliest youth in the world. He thanked her for having saved him from his enchantment, and told her that he was the king and queen's eldest son and heir to the kingdom. Then he asked her whether she would keep her promise she had made to the Lindorm to share everything with him. To this she was well content to answer, Yes. Each time that the Lindorm had held his wedding, one of the king's retainers was sent next morning to open the door of the bridal chamber, and see whether the bride was alive. This next morning also he peeped in at the door, but what he saw there surprised him so much that he shut the door in a hurry, and hastened to the king and queen, who were waiting for his report. He told them of the wonderful sight he had seen. On the floor lay seven Lindorm skins and six snow-white shirts, and beside these three worn-out scrubbing brushes, while in the bed, a beautiful youth was lying asleep beside the fair young maiden. The king and queen marveled greatly what this could mean, but just then the old woman who was spoken of in the beginning of the story was again brought in to the queen. 
she reminded her how she had not followed her instructions, but had eaten the first onion with all its skins, on which account her firstborn had been a lindorm. The waiting woman was then summoned, and admitted that she had thrown it out through the window into the forest. The king and queen now sent for their eldest son and his young bride. They took them both in their arms, and asked him to tell about his sorrowful lot during the twenty years he had lived in the forest as a hideous lindorm. This he did, and then his parents had it proclaimed over the whole country that he was their eldest son, and along with his spouse should inherit the country and kingdom after them. Prince Lindorm and his beautiful wife now lived in joy and prosperity for a time in the palace, and when his father was laid in the grave, not long after this he obtained the whole kingdom. Soon afterwards his mother also departed from this world. Now it happened that an enemy declared a war against the young king, and as he foresaw that it would be three years at the least before he could return to his country and his queen, he ordered all his servants who remained at home to guard her most carefully, that they might be able to write to each other in confidence. He had two seal rings made, one for himself and one for his young queen and issued an order that no one, under pain of death, was to open any letter that was sealed with one of these. Then he took farewell of his queen and marched out to war. The queen's wicked stepmother had heard with great grief that her beautiful stepdaughter had prospered so well that she had not only preserved her life, but had even become queen of the country. She now plotted continually how she might destroy her good fortune. While King Lindorm was away at the war, the wicked woman came to the queen, and spoke fair to her, saying that she had always foreseen that her stepdaughter was destined to be something great in the world, and that she had on this account secured that she should be the enchanted prince's bride. The queen, who did not imagine that any person could be so deceitful, bade her stepmother welcome, and kept her beside her. Soon after this the queen had two children the prettiest boys that any one could see. When she had written a letter to the king to tell him of this, her stepmother asked leave to comb her hair for her, as her own mother used to do. The queen gave her permission, and the stepmother combed her hair until she fell asleep. Then she took the seal ring off her neck, and exchanged the letter for another, in which she had written that the queen had given birth to two whelps. When the king received this letter he was greatly distressed, but he remembered how he himself had lived for twenty years as a lindorm, and had been freed from the spell by his young queen. He therefore wrote back to his most trusted retainer that the queen and her two whelps should be taken care of while he was away. The stepmother, however, took this letter as well, and wrote a new one, in which the king ordered that the queen and two little princes should be burnt at the stake. This she also sealed with the queen's seal, which was in all respect like the king's. The retainer was greatly shocked and grieved at the king's orders, for which he could discover no reason, but, as he had not the heart to destroy three innocent beings, he had a great fire kindled, and in these he burnt a sheep and two lambs, so as to make people believe that he had carried out the king's commands. The stepmother had made these known to the people, adding that the queen was a wicked sorceress. The faithful servant, however, told the queen that it was the king's command that during the years he was absent in the war she should keep herself concealed in the castle, so that no one but himself should see her and the little princes. The queen obeyed, and no one knew but that both she and her children had been burned. But when the time came near for King Lindorm to return home from the war, the old retainer grew frightened because he had not obeyed his orders. He therefore went to the queen and told her everything at the same time showing her the king's letter containing the command to burn her and the princes. He then begged her to leave the palace before the king returned. The queen now took her two little sons, and wandered out into the wild forest. They walked all day without ending a human habitation, and became very tired. The queen then caught sight of a man who carried some venison. He seemed very poor and wretched, but the queen was glad to see a human being and asked him whether he knew where she and her little children could get a house over their heads for the night. The man answered that he had a little hut in the forest, and that she could rest there, but he also said that he was one who lived entirely apart from men, 
and owned no more than the hut, a horse, and a dog, and supported himself by hunting. The queen followed him to the hut and rested there overnight with her children, and when she awoke in the morning the man had already gone out hunting. The queen then began to put the room in order and prepare food, so that the, when the man came home he found everything neat and tidy, and this seemed to give him some pleasure. He spoke but little, however, and all that he said about himself was that his name was Peter. Later in the day he rode out into the forest, and the queen thought that he looked very unhappy. While he was away she looked about her in the hut a little more closely, and found a tub full of shirts stained with blood lying among water. She was surprised at this, but thought that the man would get the blood on his shirt when he was carrying home venison. She washed the shirts and hung them up to dry, and said nothing to Peter about the matter. After some time had passed, she noticed that every day he came riding home from the forest, he took off a blood-stained shirt and put on a clean one. She then saw that it was something else than the blood of the deer that stained his shirts, so one day she took courage and asked him about it. At first he refused to tell her, but then she related to him her own story, and how she had succeeded in delivering the Lindorm. He then told her that he had formerly lived a wild life, and finally entered into a written contract with the evil spirit. Before this contract had expired, he had repented and turned from his evil ways, and withdrawn himself to this solitude. The evil one had then lost all power to take him, but so long as he had the contract he could compel him to meet him in the forest each day at a certain time, where the evil spirits then scourged him till he bled. Next day, when the time came for the man to ride into the forest, the queen asked him to stay at home and look after the princes, and she would go to meet the evil spirits in his place. The man was amazed, and said that this would not only cost her her life, but would also bring upon him a greater misfortune than the one he was already under. She bade him be of good courage, look to see that she had the three nuts which she had found beside her mother's grave, mounted her horse, and rode out into the forest. When she had ridden for some time, the evil spirits came forth and said, Here comes Peter's horse and Peter's hound, but Peter himself is not with them. Then at a distance she heard a terrible voice demanding to know what she wanted. I have come to get Peter's contract, said she. At this there arose a terrible uproar among the evil spirits, and the worst voice among them all said, Ride home and tell Peter that when he comes to-morrow he shall get twice as many strokes as usual. The queen then took one of her nuts and cracked it, and turned her horse about. At this sparks of flyer flew out of all the trees, and the evil spirits howled as if they were being scourged back to their abode. Next day at the same time the queen again rode out into the forest. But on this occasion the spirits did not dare come so near her. They would not, however, give up the contract, but threatened both her and the man. Then she cracked her second nut, and all the forest behind her seemed to be in fire and flames, and the evil spirits howled even worse than on the previous day. But the contract they would not give up. The queen had only one nut left now but even that she was ready to give up in order to deliver the man. This time she cracked the nut as soon as she came near the place where the spirits appeared, and what then happened to them she could not see. But amid wild screams and howls the contract was handed to her at the end of a long branch. The queen rode happily home to the hut, and happier still was the man who had been sitting there in great anxiety for now he was freed from all the power of the evil spirits. Meanwhile, King Lindorm had come home from the war, and the first question he asked when he entered the palace was about the queen and the whelps. The attendants were surprised. They knew of no whelps. The queen had had two beautiful princes, but the king had sent orders that all these were to be burned. The king grew pale with sorrow and anger, and ordered them to summon his trusted retainer, to whom he had sent the instructions that the queen and the whelps were to be carefully looked after. The retainer, however, showed him the letter in which there was written that the queen and her children were to be burned, and everyone then understood that some great treachery had been enacted. 
When the king's trusted retainer saw his master's deep sorrow, he confessed to him that he had spared the lives of the queen and the princes, and had only burned a sheep and two lambs, and had kept the queen and her children hidden in the palace for three years, but had sent her out into the wild forest just when the king was expected home. When the king heard this, his sorrow was lessened, and he said that he would wander out into the forest and search for his wife and children. If he found them, he would return to his palace, but if he did not find them, he would never see it again. And in that case the faithful retainer, who had saved the lives of the queen and the princes, should be king in his stead. The king then went forth alone into the wild forest, and wandered there the whole day without seeing a single human being. So it went with him the second day also, but on the third day he came by roundabout ways to the little hut. He went in there, and asked for leave to rest himself for a little on the bench. The queen and princes were there, but she was poorly clad and so sorrowful that the king did not recognize her, neither did he think for a moment that the two children, who were dressed only in rough skins, were his own sons. He lay down on the bench, and, tired as he was, he soon fell asleep. The bench was a narrow one, and as he slept his arm fell down and hung by the side of it. "'My son, go and lift your father's arm up onto the bench,' said the queen to one of the princes, for she easily knew the king again, although she was afraid to make herself known to him. The boy went and took the king's arm, but, being only a child, he did not lift it up very gently on to the bench. The king woke at this, thinking at first that he had fallen into a den of robbers, but he decided to keep quiet and pretend that he was asleep until he should find out what kind of folk were in the house. He lay still for a little, and as no one moved in the room, he again let his arm glide down off the bench. Then he heard the woman's voice say, My son, go you and lift your father's arm up on the bench, but don't do it so roughly as your brother did. Then he felt a pair of little hands softly clasping his arm. He opened his eyes and saw his queen and her children. He sprang up and caught all three in his arms, and afterwards took them along with the man and his horse and his hound, back to the palace with great joy. The most unbounded rejoicing reigned there then, as well as over the whole kingdom, but the wicked stepmother was burned. King Lindorm lived long and happily with his queen, and there are some who say that if they are not dead now, they are still living to this day. End of King Lindorm Recording by Elliot Miller, www.voiceofe.com